Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Michelle Van Curve. I am an autistic blogger for my own website known as, as The World of Autism. I've been running the web, my own blog website for a little over two years now. And, I, and, and within over a year, I've conducted so many different guest interviews. I've done over 30 of them including autistic self-advocates, professionals, therapists, family members, all to bring in the communities together to have, to share our own perspectives and to benefit the community a lot through education and advocacy. So tonight I have, this is the first time I actually have two guests on. One I had a guest that was on before, you may know her, and then I have one new guest. And so I'm happy to introduce back uh, Meredith Edmonds, and I am happy to bring on Kevin. How are you both doing tonight? Yeah, I'm doing great. Just doing great to great, be here. Michelle. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. pleasure to be on with both of you. <clears throat> awesome. <laughs> Can you tell about like a little briefly about yourselves and then like your connections with the autism community? All right, would you like me to start, Michelle? Uh, sure. Okay, so um, I'm Dr. Mary Beth Edmonds. Mm -hmm. I've been a principal in a New Jersey school for many, many years. And uh, with that, with my role, I had a large responsibility to um, support our students with special needs and also uh, oversee our bullying policy. So I'll have some thoughts about that tonight. I'm also um, a member of the New Jersey Autism Think Tank, where we originally met and uh, Kevin uh, met also. And um, I, um, am, uh, I serve on the board of Eden Autism Services in New Jersey, which provides um, services for individuals with autism. And uh, I'm also a parent of an adult um, who has autism. So I'm very connected to the autism community for decades now. That is awesome, Maribeth. And Kevin, what's your, tell us a little bit about yourself and then your connection with the autism community. Great. Thanks, Michelle. And, and I also, too, have, have been serving on the New Jersey Autism Think Tank for, for about three years now um, with, with Dr. Edmonds and with yourself. Um, I've also, too, been, been working for about 30 years in the um, IT industry, specifically around ed tech. Um, I've represented multiple technologies for individuals with, with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I've also served on the Board of Education in, in my town, so um, have had experience with, um, with you know, um, our disability population as well. That is awesome. That is awesome. And yes, with Maribeth and Kevin, like we all have been together through the New Jersey Autism Think Tank <clears throat> for many years, and we still stay connected ever since then. It has been great. It definitely has been great. And now I want to transition into like where we talk about, we tie in now about with technology as with Kevin with your now recently with Stop It Solutions, and then with Maribeth, with your, uh, with your background of uh, working, of uh, being a principal in the schools and stuff because of the fact about how technology is so integrated into the schools uh, nowadays. And I could tell you from my, from my view as a paraprofessional that we use so much technology in our learning and, and for safety. So my question to start off for Kevin is that how is your job with um, your, your company, Stop It Solutions, how has it been keeping everyone safe in schools? Great, great question, Michelle, and thank you for that, right? So, so our goal at, at Stop It Solutions is to keep students and staff safe. Right. First and foremost, that is that is our mission. And we do that by providing simple, fast and powerful ways to anonymously report safety concerns, misconduct, 
harassment and bullying for students and staff to help others or themselves, right? We make it very simple um, to do that because we know students are afraid to come forward, right? Students are afraid to be labeled a snitch or a rat or to have folks just not believe what what they have to say. So providing them with that safe, anonymous and trusted environment to be able to voice their concerns um, makes it much more likely that they'll come forward and, and be an upstander, right? And we don't consider an upstander being a snitch. It's an upstander voicing a concern about could be a friend, could be just hearing that somebody's having a bad day and has had suicidal thoughts or they're having challenges at home and, and maybe just a simple report of, hey, you know what? Treat Johnny with some care today. He's going through some rough times at home, right? So again, just providing that safe environment and that safe space to voice concerns. That is really important because the fact of how how much of as we know with like the the increased rates of with uh in regards of suicide thoughts from any kind of student and just the fact that like having the technology that should be providing a safe space rather than like how how unfortunately that the way that people have used uh, have used um, technology, like especially like online, like for social media and stuff that we've seen online with cyberbullying and facing with harassments online. And I'm glad to hear about how much that of your company is doing to, to reduce that. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point, Michelle. And, and what we've seen from, you know, from some studies is about three quarters of a million children are victims of school violence annually, right? 17% mm -hmm. of teens have considered suicide. 60% of students have stated that they've been bullied or harassed online, right? So you look at all these different tools, social media tools, they're also weapons for cyberbullying, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and 85% and of, of student incidents are witnessed by somebody, yet only 20 to 30% of them are ever reported to an adult, right? Absolutely, yeah, it's, we're, we're the fact that like students have, due to the fact that if they've been a victim, that it's hard for them to be able to have, mm -hmm. A voice to uh, to advocate for themselves and to say like this has been happening and occurring and stuff. Uh, Maribeth, if you want to add anything from your perspective. Oh, um, sure. Kevin uh, touched upon a couple of threads that um, I'd like to you know pick up on. Um, in elementary school, we start in kindergarten teaching children to understand feelings, to understand the feelings of others and um, to be kind, right? And as a matter of fact, today's Random Act of Kindness Day. I don't know if you um, heard, about that. You heard about that. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a, a perfect day to have this conversation uh, with you and Kevin. And so, so we, we start that uh, very, very early in, and we teach the children there's a difference between reporting an incident and tattletaling. If a child is going to tattletale, then they're they're making a report just to get some kid in trouble. But but if if a child is reporting something that they've witnessed, then that's that's an important thing, and that's not designed just to get someone in trouble. It's to keep everybody safe. So so those lessons and those messages start very early on. But what I have found in my experience is by fourth grade. <laughs> When I talk to kids, when I try to unravel and pull apart what has happened with an incident, the kids will tell me, oh, I don't want to be a rat. Right. Fourth grade, these are mm -hmm. nine-year-old students. So somewhere in the culture, somewhere 
and and Kevin and I didn't work in the same district, so it's not as if we we uh, were in the same district. I mean, this is pretty uh, prevalent. Kids kids will will start to say, "I don't want to be a rat," and they they that culture begins very very early. So it's hard to dig out uh, the information, and sometimes uh, the principals faced with serious, um, serious incidents because things have gone on and, and no one has, um, reported it. And so we want kids to be upstanders. We absolutely want them to feel really good about being upstanders. And we encourage that and try to make safe spaces for kids to do that. Now, the, um, the piece that makes this all the more complicated is this, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, now more and more students have not only a Chromebook device that they're using for, for their studies and for their lessons in school, but a lot of kids by the time they get to fifth grade have their own mobile device. And, and this is where we're starting to see the, the complication where kids uh, send messages and, um, and do unkind things on the, um, on the Internet. And so that's even a little more difficult because that could be happening at home and kids aren't telling their parents and so on. So, so the more tools and the more conversations we could have, um, certainly our guidance counselors, our teachers, uh, myself included as a principal, constant messaging is going on in the schools. And that combined with tools to help kids um, express and feel comfortable to say, you know, somebody's not being kind, we need to stop this, um, is, is going to help all of us try to reduce uh, these incidents of bullying. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to add to that because you, you talked about this, right? And so this becomes a weapon, mm -hmm. right? You know, a mm -hmm. weapon for cyberbullying, right? And our platform, right? focuses on turning this to be a method of doing good, mm -hmm. right? A, a, because we're, we're meeting the students in their world. They spend so much time on their mobile devices. Well, let's make that an avenue for good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Instead of using it as a, like, instead of using it like a, as a, as a bad thing, let's turn the bad thing into a good thing. Yep. And that's where, you know, what I'm coming out of this is that at first is that it's so important to, it's so important to stand up for yourself because of the fact that, that, that this is occurring for yourself and for others because the fact that, that, with bullying, especially cyberbullying, has been occurring more and more as, as with students are gaining access to phones so early on. And I could say that myself because of with the with the school district that I work in and the school itself, like more kids early on are having access to with Chromebooks to cell phones, like bringing the school, and it just you know that it does increase the risk of with cyberbullying, but having the right tools and using our phones, like for students to use their phones the right way and, and knowing uh, to be, to be uh, citizens of with technology online, that's the key to making it better for everybody online, if you guys- Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and through that, you know, we, we want to help to create a culture, right, where every student and staff member is empowered to be an upstander. And because students and staff play an enormous role in, in school safety and well-being, right? They are the, the keepers of, of the environment. Right, right. right. And it, it truly does take that. And at the same time, we also need the resources and the tools, not only that it's important for, for teachers, staff, and even for parents of, of students to keep an eye out about the way technology is used through the students. It's also about with having the tools and the resources, like <clears throat> with 
with you, Kevin, with Stop It Solutions, how your company has been working collaboratively with schools. And so from that, using a resource like your company, it does not only, it not only like the staff and everyone is making, keeping an eye out with the students, that's another resource to make sure that there's, there's a reduction in with cyberbullying and other forms of harassment and everything else. Yeah, and and you know we're we're honored as as a as a company, right? And and we're a mission driven first company, and we're honored to be in partnership with with over seventeen hundred school districts in mm -hmm. the United States, um, working in over seven thousand buildings and helping to keep over four million students safe, right? Yeah. We're we're honored to to work with our, our school district partners to help create that culture, right? That that keeps their students and staff safe. That's fabulous. fabulous. That, is, that is awesome. That is definitely awesome. And uh, Maribeth, do you think that there should be a uh, continue of more collaboration between like technology companies like Kevin's and, and like in just in schools in general? Well, uh Absolutely. And, you know, each each district has its own tech. Uh, they call them acceptable use policies. And um, and that's that's a, a standard, I would say, in most districts. I, I, I don't really know of any districts in New Jersey that wouldn't have that. So, um, you know, the school districts have some kind of a contract that student, the family, and the school that says, here's the appropriate use of our technology, and here's the things that you can do, and here's things that you cannot do. And if, uh, and if you abuse uh, the technology, whether it's the device itself, or when you're on uh, the internet and doing schoolwork, or, or you uh, reach out to another student improperly, uh, you know, there are consequences, it's called a code of conduct, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's a loss of privileges. So um, to begin with, schools typically have their, um, their protocols and their plans, and then and making a connection with um, support from outside companies is going to be helpful, helpful to districts, especially that doesn't have a lot of resources on its own. Right. So so if um, if a district is a smaller district, let's say, or they don't have um, uh, personnel in installed to kind of, you know, have their own bullying, let's say their own bullying um, specialist, for example, uh, mm -hmm. having having a company support that has um, that has tools in place and procedures in place is, is going to be a big help. So. Um, it, it, we can't understate it because we, despite the fact that we try working on this from very early age to make children feel safe and supported and respected, uh, there's still incidents where students are um, subjected to acts of bullying and, um, and, and some students uh, unfortunately uh, take their lives, which is, is certainly something that um, we, we have to stop. We have to stop every kid that's thinking about hurting himself or herself. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the pandemic has just exacerbated all of this, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, the, the mental health of not only our students, but also of our staff has, has taken a beating over the past, past couple of years. But I, but I do want to touch on, right, the, our our most vulnerable students, so students with disabilities, right? We, mm -hmm. we talked about this just very briefly earlier, right? But mm -hmm. students with disabilities are disproportionately affected by bullying at all ages and in all learning settings. And, it, and it's not only the, their fellow students who are doing the bullying, sometimes it's the staff um, that's involved in it. And what we've seen, and, and Ironically, there aren't a lot of studies in the U.S. about um, the effects of, of bullying on students with disabilities. But what I was able to learn was female students with disabilities are four times as likely to be bullied 
right, than their classmates without disabilities. And male students are three times as likely to be bullied than, than their, um, than their uh, classmates without disabilities. That's staggering, right? You know, you see just the overall numbers of, of bullying in general and to see that that most vulnerable population is, is bullied at a rate substantially higher um, is, is definitely concerning. And we need to do all that we can to not only protect all of our students, but really make sure that we're protecting our most vulnerable ones. Exactly, exactly. And I feel like that as, as we continue to learn more about like the ways with technology because of how much it's been evolving, that I feel like just the fact that with using technology the right way, it's because the way that it's been used, especially over the years by the way the students are using, not only that it's important to, to monitor, but just the fact of teaching the right ways of using it. And that's why it's important to have the tools and the resources uh, there, so that way we could reduce with bullying and, su and suicide among students, especially including with the our most vulnerable population. And and Mary Beth, right? Maybe you can you can shed some light on this, right? But I believe it's about starting early, right? Really, it, the education starts early, and it's and it's being able to deal with root causes of, of why these things happen in the first place, right? So taking a proactive approach instead of waiting for something to happen and then being reactive to an incident that has already taken place. Right, and, that, and that's, that's part of the community building that takes place in the school. It, it's, it's part of learning how to uh, care for one another in our environments that we share. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I found the same thing that there's few studies on uh, bullying of uh, students with disabilities. But the, the important thing is that students who, with disabilities are a protected class. Uh, that's, that's, um, you know, that's a federal, a federal standard. And so um, students who are cognitively or physically um, uh, disabled, let's, uh, well, I'll use that word that might not be the best word at the moment, but um, we, we need to know that um, that's a distinguishing characteristic and it's, it's absolutely um, prohibited. And, um, and, and it's hard, it's, it's really hard for the kids who with with those um, acts of bullying because they're they're not quite sure sometimes why someone's treating them that way mm -hmm. or or if they're cognitively impaired they may not even understand what what is happening to them and so um, so the more communication we can have the more our teachers have um, who work with our special education are going to be able to tell them that. Um, you know, this is not a good thing, and this is how we are kind to one another. Um, it, it all helps because that's that's the hard part. The hard part is helping children understand um, that somebody's being mean to them. That's yeah. that's a hard part. Right. Agreed. Yes. And the other thing, that. too, um, Michelle, what I what I do want to mention is that uh, in New Jersey, twice a year, the uh, superintendent of schools has to make a public report of the incidents of bullying, mm -hmm. harassment, intimidation that uh, take place in the schools. Now, of course, they're not saying um, um, who <laughs> the target right. is, right? And they're, yeah. they're not naming any names, but they, they will uh, quantify how many um, investigations there are and how many are confirmed uh, bullying based on um, the letter of the law. But what we do find is that children who are overweight wear glasses, uh, who are special education, those we, we have, those are the targets. Those are the target. We have other, um, sometimes kids who have religious dress are victimized. So um, these, these are the things that 
we in the school need to pay attention and um, I, it's important that we continue to send this message and have these conversations with kids. Yep. And, and just to, to add on to that, and I think COVID is going to continue to impact that for, for some more time. I was, I was talking with a, with a superintendent over the last couple of days and, and his message to me was, in the next couple of weeks to months as mask mandates start to be removed or made optional or said you're going to see an explosion of bullying and harassment going on right and regardless of of what side of the fence you you sit on there's going to be those incidents uh, a major uptick in those incidents in the schools kids who aren't wearing masks, bullying those who are, and, and potentially vice versa. And kids may have very good reason to continue to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. if they're immunocompromised yep. or someone at home um, has a health condition. There's going to be some very important reasons why some children may continue to wear a mask and have a need to. So yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Kevin uh, raises a good point that um, there's probably more to come because the masks have symbolic of um, uh, the tension between um, people who are following the rules of the health emergency and some people who prefer not to. Right. Yes, you guys made a, a really good point about that because especially with we, the fact that we still have with COVID around that that's another factor that is again that's going to increase about with even with cyberbullying because the more that that we've been like experiencing online like where the schools have been through based with virtual learning and everything and the way that that students have to communicate with their classmates their teacher and everything so and also just in general with more people having access to, more students are getting access to technology early on uh, and home. So I think we could all say that like technology is gonna be continuing to impact students inclusively. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I wanted to wrap up with that and I wanna just generally Generously, thank you both so much for coming on to talk about this important topic because I feel like that that this is what the community should understand that this is what everyone has been facing with for so long. And by really working together, it can make it could just make a better place for everyone. And, and you're right. And uh, Michelle, the good news is um, uh, friends of autism have someone like you to keep the conversation going, keep it real and authentic, because that's that's the other part of it, too. We don't we don't want the conversation to be um, pigeonholed somewhere that's, oh, yeah, we have to take care of bullying, too, uh, that that it's it's inclusive of all our students and, and how we take our students and staff in our school community. So thank you for hosting tonight. I appreciate yeah. it. Yes, thank you, Michelle. It's it's been a pleasure to be on be on with both of you. And you know, I'll I'll leave you with this. Um, you know, we we talked about whether in the future technology will continue to play a major role. And it mm -hmm. will, right? And while the work we do is is important and, and impactful and makes a difference. We can't do what, what we do without that partnership between students, staff, and communities, right? Technology is one piece of the puzzle, an important part, but it doesn't work without the collaboration and partnership and support of students, staff, and communities. Exactly, collaboration is the, is the key. You can't just have one thing alone. Absolutely, right. absolutely, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, for all my followers, just to make sure that you know that that to follow me as 
exceptional show on my social media accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And you also can find with this, with all my guest interviews on the world of autism and in, on my YouTube channel. So thank you guys. <laughs> Good for you, thank Michelle. You. Thank you. Have a fantastic evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay.